It's impossible to look at the world of retail without thinking about how technology has changed things. We talked to two experts about a whole range of subjects, what their companies are doing in retail tech, but also about how consumers feel about these new technological improvements. Welcome back. I'm joined by Simon from Everything and Edward from RV Networks. We're talking about retail technology today. Gentlemen, thanks very much indeed for giving up your time to, to join me. I've been wandering around this incredible arena uh, today, seeing all the wild and various uh, elements of technology, but something perhaps closer to my heart is the retail side of things and some of the fast-moving innovations that are going on. If I could kick off by asking uh, Simon, perhaps, to give me your sort of definition of retail technology and, and the place you play in that. Uh, wow, retail technology, it's a, it's a pretty broad one. Um, yeah, ultimately, it depends on your perspective, uh, you know, whether that's the retailer or the, uh, or the consumer that uses retail. Um, it's probably easier if I explain where we, we feel we sit in that. We work with uh, brands and consumer products manufacturers um, who use retail as their primary outlet to reach their consumers. Um, and so from a technology perspective, what's really important to, uh, to these guys is you know, the, um, ens to ensure that when their products are on, sh on shelf in store, that they're um, attracting customers, that they're converting customers in from browsing to, to making those purchases. Um, and traditionally, they've struggled to um, get a, enough data to inform their decision making on you know, what the right um, mix of brand is and, and what the most effective uh, campaign is. So for them, um, having data that informs them about that is really, really important. I want to come back in uh, a moment and talk about that because some of the very interesting things that you're doing about uh, bringing sort of physical uh, products uh, into the uh, IoT space. Sam, what about yourself in terms of your own company's focus around retail? Retail, as Simon was saying, is this broad spectrum of applying data and technology products to traditional retail, to uh, Amazon and disruptive retail uh, plays. And, and for us, we're really playing in that disruptive play because every traditional retail vendor needs to move into a online presence, an online channel. And, and what we do is help them scale that uh, online presence so that they can build up a, a, a website, an a e-commerce site, a, 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 a distribution, a, a sales site to handle that. And one of our customers is a payment processor. Uh, and at peaks, they may get millions of transactions and uh, in low times, they're getting no transactions. They don't want to put in the infrastructure for all that. So we're a software-defined load balancing technology that enables them to scale their technology when they need it, scale their infrastructure when they need it, and then scale it back down so they can control cost and sprawl. Um, Edward, how were people doing that in the past? They were using fixed assets, and so you had to build a large website and have it running all the time to serve those peak loads. Now they can, deploy, they can use cloud capacity, cloud technologies to flexibly scale up and scale down their environment. Simon, I was reading a bit about you uh, in advance and um, some of the things you're doing feel like they didn't have a predecessor and it's, it's quite new to the Dead market. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, historically the retailer has owned all of the data about consumer journeys, consumer interaction from the moment they walk in store to the point where they, they take product home. Um, and you know the, the tension between the retailer and the consumer products manufacturers has been an, an interesting one, one that's under a lot of pressure, particularly from you know the e-commerce giants and, and the changing behaviour of you know us consumers these days, particularly the, the smartphone generation. Um, and you're right, you know the, 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 there is no sort of predecessor to what we're doing, which is giving products on the shelf in store a digital life, bringing those products to life so that I as a consumer can scan the product and get some information informing my purchase, but also the brand and the retailer can get data and analytics about the 
uh, the, the uptake of that product, the uh, conversion of that product. Um, it can also be used by the retailer in store for you know, combating shrinkage, ensuring they don't have uh, out of stock situations, and generally you know, being more efficient about the, you know, the rotation of their products and making sure that they, you know, they're, they're maximizing the, the utilization of shelf space. I can see the, uh, the benefits from the retailer uh, point of view, but do you ever hit privacy concerns from a consumer point of view? Are they scared by these kind of innovations? Um, it's an interesting one. It, you know, it's certainly, you know, it's certainly one that's hotly debated. You know, from our perspective, you know, we're not holding and storing personal information in that regard. Um, you know, users, uh, sorry, consumers that would share their information, do so through you know, well-proven platforms like Facebook and other social media channels. So you know, I think the generation of consumers today that um, are you know, comfortable with sharing certain amounts of information are also comfortable with what's happening with that data because they're being served up products and content that are relevant for them and they're using, you know, ultimately the manufacturers are using the, their interaction digitally to make better products and make more informed products. Edward, what about your take on the consumer sort of privacy, perhaps concerns, or perhaps a sort of general unawareness of that data that, that, uh, that's being captured and sometimes the surprise that consumers have when they find out so much data is available about them? Well, I think one of the things that's uh, surprising to me as a consumer is how blasé we all are about our private data. I mean, we go onto these websites, these apps, and we press accept, and, they've, and they show us a privacy policy. Well, as a consumer, I say, great, they've got a privacy policy. It isn't a privacy policy, it's a how I'm going to use your data policy. Uh, and, and we accept it. Uh, and so I just think that's uh, the, the, the modern world. Um, and you know, if we're going to take it back, it's going to need to have government intervention um, to, to do that, uh, if indeed we want to, because there are tremendous benefits we get. You know, when I go to the store, and, and it says, hey, you like these type of things, you might be interested in this product. Well, that's an invasion, but that's also useful because there are tons of things out there. So there's a balance. I think it's that great argument about if advertising was, every time advert you saw, you thought, oh, this is fantastic, a product I really want. It would cease to feel like advertising, would actually feel like a, a life benefit. But it's only whenever we serve things that are irrelevant to us or they, they have no sort of meaning or connection, then it actually feels like you're, you're actually being advertised to in a negative sense. I mean, the, the reality is when, when you connect products and data to the web, new new value can be created from these digital services so if I know that by going to the store the product that I want is there already or I've already predetermined it's going to be there that's valuable to me because it's you know it's not a, a burden on my time to go and search for the product only to discover it's not available so actually there's value to me in giving up some data in order to get that back Equally, if I'm the manufacturer of the product, I want to know I'm making the right products and putting them in the right places where my consumers can access them. Simon, from your own point of view, how are you competing with, say, bigger companies that are trying to get into the same space as you or perhaps are already in the space? That's, it's kind of interesting because, frankly, we're not seeing um, many competitors in this space. What we're doing is focusing very much on product uh, product data, product identity, um, and, and really we're the sort of, you know, our role is um, the IoT engine for product, um, product information, intelligence, applications and connections to the web. And really nobody else is doing that. You know, everybody else who's in the IoT space is focusing on, you know, machine to machine and they're focusing on, you know, connecting um, products that already have power and silicon. You know, we're, what we're doing is we're connecting any product. You know, our vision is all about every product can be connected. You know, or every product that can be connected to the web will be. Um, so whether that's a, you know, a packet of cereal, a tin of soda, or a bottle of wine, it could also be the electric toothbrush that's already got power and it's got some smarts built in. But it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I think it's very, very interesting. Um, Edward, what about uh, your point of view in terms of where you sit as a company of a certain size versus, as I say, your existing players or, or new forces in the market? Our play is really that virtualized, flexible, uh, cloud-like uh, application services, elastic application services. Whereas traditionally, 
customers have not been uh, as flexible. They've been more point products in the appliance load balancing space. And as such, as, as retail is going through this tremendous change, retailers need the flexibility to bring on new technologies like uh, Simon's, and they need the flexibility to scale that. What happens, I mean, if a million people get on or start using these applications, you need the infrastructure to support that. And really, our flexibility plays to that. That leads me uh, into talking about, uh, I guess, the stand that we're sitting here uh, just at the moment. And I've been walking around, as I say, and seeing your respective companies, uh, you know, dr drumming up a really uh, sort of interested audience. Um, and that's, of course, Cisco Investments. I mean, both your companies have either taken investment or have a connection um, through. What um, benefits have you found uh, yourself from, from that Cisco side of things? Yeah. Well, the Cisco Investment booth attracts people who are very interested in what's uh, the future of technology. What is, how is it changing society? Uh, and, and driving dramatically lower cost, more functionality, more flexibility, faster time to whatever you need to do. And because of that, it's, it's natural for, for us to be here because we are doing that in our space. So forward thinking uh, people in the industry are coming here. The other thing, of course, is Cisco is just a, a fantastic brand name in, in networking, and they want their um, fingers in what's uh, exciting in the future, and so there's a good synergy there also. Simon, what things have you been able to, to do, perhaps, with the company that you couldn't have otherwise? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, obviously, a lot of, a lot of my comments would, would echo Ed's, but I think what's really interesting is the, uh, it provides a platform, provides a showcase, um, and, and, and frankly, it, um, it allows us to access um, technology leaders within organizations that might otherwise never hear of us. Uh, and I think that's, that's quite important when, you know, Cisco have positioned themselves as a, as a sort of technology leader. Um, you know, certainly the, the, their investments bear that out. And what we're doing, you know, to your earlier point, is, is, is groundbreaking. You know, there aren't people, you know, there aren't 10 companies doing what we're doing. And therefore, Part of our mission is about educating and disrupting the, the kind of status quo. Um, and so I think Cisco does provide us with a, a you know, platform and events like this where we can, you know, we can start to have conversations with people we might otherwise not speak with. If we were sitting here in uh, five years' time, and uh, I hope we, we all are, and uh, I get to hear about the successes in the meantime, um, just trying to sort of visualize that. So taking us back to, uh, to, to here just now, Edward, from your point of view, what one thing, uh, if we could sum it up as one thing, excites you the most or scares you the most over the, the few forthcoming next five years? You're not including politics? Well, <laughs> that's definitely one for a drink oh. after the session. But, but from a technological point of view or from a business uh, point of view, I think that the rate of change is so rapid that we risk leaving uh, customers behind. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do here. Uh, you know, I'm going to throw my hands up. I, they might go down the wrong path. So it's imperative that uh, the industry really focus on how our solutions change our customers more businesses rather than how cool our technology is. Yeah, yeah, a really, really valid point. I guess it always does come back to the customers as well because ultimately, though, if they don't understand the, the need, you, you, you have no ability to pick up the work, but also they're the, sometimes the greatest challenge, as you said, um, the sort of distraction in the marketplace. Even just walking around the stands, it takes a long time perhaps to, to do that and to pick these kind of things up. Um, Simon, from your point of view, I mean, take going back five years, the business probably couldn't have existed. And so looking forward is a big challenge. But I'm going to put that question to you. I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, for me, what's really clear, uh, if I think about, you know, similar events five years ago, and I, you're right, we, you know, we wouldn't have been at such events, we couldn't have been at such events. I think what we'll see in the next five years is the, the real explosion of ecosystems. So for, for me, you know, in order for a lot of these um, consumer products companies and retailers to, to really scale their digital transformation strategies, it's going to be about the ecosystem of technology partners, consumers are part of that, and you know, frankly, competitors are part of that as well. And, and you know, ultimately, data is at the heart of all of those things. Um, and so for us being you know, at the forefront of making products smart and therefore 
making them available to an ecosystem, that's phenomenally exciting. I remember years and years ago seeing a sort of presentation of what the future home would look like. You know, everything would be touch screen, you know, at a time when all our televisions were giant boxes and lights would come on as we walked in and things like this. And I was old enough to know that these things, they would never be, you know, it would take years and years and years. And yet walking around today, seeing this kind of, uh, you know, change of technology is so exciting. And to me, it feels like it's, it's moving even faster. Um, Simon, Edward, thanks so much indeed for your time. Enjoy the rest of the show. And I look forward to speaking to you in those five years and seeing if we got it half right. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks for joining us.